Good morning. Thank you for tuning in for our Explore the Bible Sunday School class. We are studying the book of Romans. This morning we're in lesson 12, and we're going to be looking at Romans 13, verses 1 through 14. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into the Word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together today to study the Word as a church, though we are apart uh, and not able to meet. Thank you that we have the hope of a future time we can meet again. And we thank you for the technology that allows us to be able to gather even if we can. So what a blessing that is. Please bless this time as we study your word. Be with any who are sick. Be with those who are going through tough times right now. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the title today of Citizens with the theme, Believers Should Seek to Represent Christ Well in their communities, and in the world. We have the key doctrine of religious liberty, civil government being ordained of God. It is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. If you want to read more about that, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 17. Let's begin this morning looking at an overview of verses 1 through 14, just a little context, and then we'll get to the text with three headings. Submit from verses 1 through 7, love in 8 through 10, and then anticipate from verses 11 through 14. Here in chapter 13, we find three ways for believers to do good and avoid evil. First, believers were commanded to submit to governing authorities. Second, Paul discussed the believer's responsibility to love. And then third, Paul reminds his audience that they were living in a time that demanded their action. So we begin with verses 1 through 7 and the heading of submit. Let's just read verses 1 through 4 for now, and then we'll move forward. Romans 13, verses 1 through 4. You take your Bible out there if you have it and read along with me. It helps to hear it and to see it. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon himself or upon him that doeth evil. So we're told here in these first verses to submit. Paul writes of the believer's relationship to governmental authorities. And he echoes here Jesus' own instruction as he says in Mark 12, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The Greek word translated be subject unto means to place oneself in a subordinate relationship to someone or something. Submission involved recognition of one's particular status in a hierarchy. And Paul gives two reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities. First, no authority can exist that is outside the scope of God's authority. All authority is subordinate to God's sovereignty. The second reason Paul gives is that the specific governing structures, structures that exist are put in place by God. When Pilate claimed at Jesus' trial to have authority over Jesus, Jesus told him, 
you would have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above, which confirms what Paul is saying here. Since God ordains governing authorities, the logical conclusion is that those who oppose authority are opposing God's ordinance. In verse number three, Paul offered another reason for believers to submit. Not only did God ordain the governmental structures that exist, he has given them the task of maintaining order in society. Ideally, people who refrain from bad conduct and do what is good have nothing to fear from rulers. Good conduct is the antidote for fear of authorities and may in fact lead to positive recognition by those authorities. Paul makes two points here about the role of authorities based on the assertion that authorities are the servants of God. First, from a positive perspective, the authorities were God's servants for the benefit of the citizens. Second, Paul unpacked the negative role of authorities toward those whose conduct was bad, toward those who break the law. Just as rulers were God's servants for good, so also they could be God's servants for vengeance. God uses governmental authorities to inflict his punishment on wrongdoers. Paul's working assumption was that the evil being punished and the good being rewarded were in line with God's moral principles. In that case, the ruler's sword was God's instrument for wrath. Now, let's move on to verses 5 through 7. Romans 13, verse 5, the Word of God says, Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay you tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Believers must submit to authorities for conscience sake. For the Christian, conscience is moral sensitivity to the will and purpose of God. Paul urged the believers to submit because it was the right thing to do. Again, Paul reminded his audience that the governing authorities were God's ministers. These rulers were accomplishing God's purpose in the act of governing. We are to willingly fulfill our obligations as citizens. Government is an institution allowed by God to serve the people. Governing authorities deserve the respect and honor due them as God's service. So we should give thanks for governing authorities and we should be in prayer for them. Now that comes directly from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Good verses to know in your Bible. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Absolute authority belongs to God alone. And we must always evaluate the demands of authorities in light of the gospel. This brings us to our first point of consideration this morning. How can we put Paul's teachings about authorities into practice in our everyday life? I think that's something for you to consider and work on. So we are to submit. Next from verses 8 through 10, we see that we are to love. Let's read verses 8 through 10. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, kill, steal, bear false witness, covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou wilt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We are to love. First, he says, owe no man anything. So believers are to repay all their obligations so that they do not owe anything to anyone. Paul's exception to that clause left one obligation open, one that can never be fully repaid, but to love one another. Can you ever finish up loving one another? Not till somebody dies. Until then, there's always a new day and another opportunity to love them. This debt of love is owed both to believers and non-believers. It's owed both to those who are friendly toward us and those who are hostile. Believers have an obligation to love because he that loveth, notice what he says here, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love for neighbor was able to sum up all the other commandments since love worketh no ill to his neighbor. The one who truly loves will do no harm to his neighbor. He will do what is good for his neighbor. Once again, Paul affirmed that the law is fulfilled in love. Go to verse or to page 109 if you have your personal study guide there, and you will see our second point of consideration. 
How does keeping the commandments listed by Paul demonstrate love for others? I think that's something we need to consider, maybe discuss there in your home. How does keeping the commandments listed by Paul demonstrate love for others? So we are to submit. We are to be loving constantly. And then finally, from verses 11 through 14, we anticipate. Let's look at verse 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. We should look at the present with a view of the future in mind. Paul wanted the church to understand the nature of the time in which they lived. The hour was marked by an uncertainty as to the timing of Jesus' return. And as a result, Paul urges here, remain steady for his return. Now, there is uncertainty about the timing of the second coming, but there is no uncertainty about the reality of the return of Christ. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can be sure that Jesus is coming soon. Paul assured the Roman believers that now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Every day is one day closer to the return of Jesus Christ. I want to be a blessing to be with him. Look at verse 12 and 13. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off our works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Paul moves from a description of the time in which the believers lived to exhortation about how to live during that time. The first image is related to changing clothes taking off one set of clothes so as to be able to put on another set of clothes. What are be to, to be discarded are the works of darkness, those activities that are characteristic of the old life. Paul gave a representative list of the deeds of darkness in verse number 13. Believers were then commanded to put on the armor of life. The bed clothes worn for sleep were inadequate for the conflict in which believers were to be engaging. We are children of light who need weapons of light. Paul explained to the believers in Thessalonica. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So we see from Paul's writings here in Romans 13 that we need the armor of light and not the works of darkness in our life. The Christian life is described here by two phrases. First, believers are to walk honestly. We're to walk in behavior that is proper or appropriate. Second, believers were to behave as in the day, not in the night, in the day. They are of the light and must live as such. Paul used three pairs of words to show what deeds of darkness look like. The first pair is rioting and drunkenness. And this refers to excessive drinking and partying. The second set of words is chambering and wantonness. This referred to reckless sexual immorality. These are not exclusively nighttime activities that he's listing here, but you'll notice in light that these are things that are frequently carried out under the cover of darkness. The final set of words is strife and envying. This is jealousy and fussing. Let's move to verse 14, where Paul says, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So put off the works of darkness and put on Christ. Believers are to embrace Christ to the point that they are transformed into his likeness by the renewing of their minds. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Verse number 1, he says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Verse number two, he says, to be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Not being conformed to the world, but being transformed through the renewing of your mind. We are not to make provision for the flesh so that we can fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Paul instructed those in the church of Galatia to walk in the spirit. The reason he wanted them to walk in the spirit was so that they would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Since the desire of the flesh is opposed to the desire of the spirit, believers too must be opposed to the desire of the flesh. Now this leads us to our final consideration for the day. In what ways does putting on the Lord Jesus Christ enable us to resist the desires of the flesh? Amen. Well, that's lesson 12, citizens. 
Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14, with the doctrine of religious liberty. We are to submit, we are to love, we are to anticipate. Amen. Thank you for joining in today. Now remember, we have service this morning. Um, after you've watched Sunday School, you can come over to church. We're going to have you separated there in groups at 9 and groups at 1030. You need to reserve your space ahead of time. So if you haven't already done that, try to jump on that very quickly. I think about an hour out, it won't let you reserve a seat anymore. If you run into that, call, text, email, something. Let us know that you're going to be here. We can only let 60 people in per service. But between that and the live stream, we should be able to cover it. We'll be live streaming at 9 and at 1030. Remember, we're collecting canned vegetables for the ark. They are in need, so bring those with you when you come. Or if you're only going to watch the live stream, bring them over to the church during the week or drop them off by the ark. We'd be happy to get them to them to you if you drop them off here. If you'd rather just make a financial donation, that would be huge to the ark during the time that we're in. Go to harpitbaptist.org, click on the giving link, and there's a fund set up just for the ark, and we'll pass that money along. All right, Wednesday night, Brother Scotty will be doing online Bible study again, and we're going to keep that pattern for the week. Sunday school live, uh, online here. Uh, on Sunday mornings, online and live, or live person and live stream services at 9 and 1030. Nothing on Sunday nights and then Wednesday night online Bible study. We'll finish the end of the month through the end of the month like that. Have a good rest of your day. Hope to see you this morning. Every grace in due.